Hi, preachers. This is Caroline Lewis. I wanted to remind you that you still have time to make a difference for working preachers in 200 countries and territories around the globe. We just received word that two anonymous longtime Luther Seminary donors with a passion for preaching and supporting new preachers have offered a $10,000 matching gift. As soon as we raise $25,000 towards the fall campaign, a $10,000 matching gift will be unlocked. Gifts of any size will make a tremendous difference. We know you rely on the resources Working Preacher provides, so we are reaching out now to ask for your help to make sure we are able to continue providing those resources week after week. Every gift makes a difference. You still have just a few more days to join hundreds of other supporters by making a gift to the fall fundraising campaign. You can make a one-time gift or a monthly gift securely online at workingpreacher.org slash donate. Thank you for supporting this vital ministry. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. This is the podcast for the 23rd Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on October 27, 2024. If you're looking for the Reformation podcast, that is available. But this is for that 23rd Sunday after Pentecost. And the readings are Jeremiah 31, 7 through 9. Our alternate first reading is Job 42, 1 through 6, and then 10 through 17. Psalm 126, Hebrews 7, 23 through 28, and Mark 10, chapter, Mark 10, verses 46 through 52. We are finally at the end of chapter 10 in Mark, blind Bartimaeus. Great story. Great Reformation story. Yes, it could be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, so we've come to the end of uh, chapter uh, chapter 10 of Mark, and uh, we move into chapter 11, obviously, uh, coming up. But uh, this brings a, a really challenging chapter to a close. Close. With this story. With a nice um, healing story again, where uh, there's... Uh, tension in the scene um, that uh, I think uh, needs to be played uh, in the sense where he's calling out, have mercy. And um, there, everybody around him is saying, shut up, <laughs> you know, be quiet. He refuses. And finally, Jesus stops, calls him and says, you know, uh, and, 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 and engages him and asks, what do you want from me? Um, I, I think the drama of that um, delay um, might fit depending on what you've been preaching the weeks before um, in, in terms of just pay, paying attention to what does it mean to uh, not make everything an easy out, not to make everything a, um, if you're in the presence of Jesus, everything's going to be fine. Um, maybe you have to ask a few questions. Maybe you have to plead your case. Maybe you have to beg for mercy. So mm. play on the drama, I think, for mm. this particular episode. Mm. Yeah, if you looked last week, or if you preached last week on James and John, here you've got Jesus asking the exact same question, what do you want me to do for you? And you've got a very different kind of request being made than what James and John wanted in terms of how to exploit positions of power. So here you've got a man who can't see, a man who's begging, uh, but then one of the delicious details of this is when he throws aside his cloak before he's even been healed with this confidence he's going to be able to find it again, uh, but also perhaps a shedding of his previous life as somebody who had to sit by the roadside and beg, which there's a confidence in that and a desperation and this image of something of a renewal that's taking place. And so that's why it's, 
it's just such a, a beautiful uh, image of faith. Do I refer to that? This is a nice, a nice Reformation text. Although my friends in the Catholic Church would say it's also a nice Catholic text or Orthodox text. <laughs> but, uh, but you know, it's also this this uh, this call to discipleship, or not even a call, but it, Bartimaeus himself decides to follow Jesus along the way, which is what Jesus has been asking folks to do throughout this gospel. And uh, we know where this way is headed. And indeed, the very start of chapter 11, um, Take us there. he will begin the entry into Jerusalem. And so there's a, there's a beauty in this. And there's also in Bartimaeus this kind of utterly uninhibited, um, I am all in with this. And so his healing is something that puts him on the road to discipleship. And of course you can talk about all the other losers around there, the people who tell him to be quiet. And then <laughs> uh, I love that Jesus doesn't walk to losers. him. Hmm. Yeah. Jesus doesn't walk to Bartimaeus. He tells all these other, again, the losers to be like, why don't you go call him here? And then they're like, Oh, he's calling for you. Let us help you. Uh, the, the fickleness of, of these other folks is, is worth um, having some fun with, I think. Yeah. I, I think that I was going to mention this, so I'm, I'm going to build off that a little bit, Matt, with regard to it's a it's a call story uh, and and so uniquely positioned in this spot of Bartimaeus following along the way. And for the you know, the to recall the calling of the disciples way back when, you know, in chapter one knowing really not knowing what the way is going to be uh, and yet and yet here they are having a better sense of what the way is and so it's uh and and yet and then also you have this new disciple right who is mm -hmm. called into right. uh called into the following of Jesus and uh and what that what that will lead to on at the same you know on on the one hand it's uh it's being able to see again, but it's following him on the way. And then verse 49, take heart, get up. It's a gero, rise up, right? And so there's these illusions of this is of that the that the way, of course, leads to the cross, but the way also leads to resurrection. And that part of part of what that discipleship life is like is also, of course, that promise as well. So there's just a lot of, just some, so many lovely, subtle, <laughs> yet uh, important connections, right. Between that, that cast Bartimaeus as this, uh, as this disciple in such a way that, uh, that really puts all of those themes that we've talked about in Mark in, 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 uh, in connecting them, I guess I would say. And there's also, uh, uh, when you said this, I, I hadn't paid attention to this before, uh, Matt, but um, another way of looking at that discarding of his cloak uh, and letting go of that past is a, is a, a letting go of a possession. Um, you know, you need all these extra things if you're not going to be able to go get another one. Um, but uh, I can follow Jesus right now. I can let go of some of the things that I've possessed yeah, that, that, that's another echo from uh, the rich young ruler mm -hmm. leaving mm -hmm. everything. Yeah, I think it's um, it, it's probably hard for a sermon to do this, but to help people get a sense for how this is now the conclusion of the central section in Mark's gospel, which yeah. if, I were, if I were teaching a class, I would talk about how this is a section of Mark's gospel, it's all about Christology and discipleship, and those are interwoven. You can't understand one and Mark without the other. And so there's something about this scene that's the culmination. I think I've been saying in previous weeks that things are happening under the canopy of deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. And this is this is kind of the, the fullness of that now being realized and being acted out in contrast to an earlier story in Mark 8, where Jesus requires two applications uh, to uh, right. restore sight to a man. Right. Now everybody's vision of who Jesus is and what he must do is a lot clearer. So to help people kind of get that, not just so that they understand Mark better, or not just for the aesthetics of Mark's order and the narrative, but that finally anything we ever ask about Christology 
who is Jesus? Why does this happen to Jesus? What are we supposed to learn? What effects flow from this? Is all meant to play itself out in discipleship in how we live, which preachers have been trying to do since all of these very difficult texts throughout um, the end of chapter eight, all of nine, and all of 10. So to kind of not pat everybody on the back, but just kind of say, this is why we've endured all these weeks of some really difficult difficult teachings where you were like, I don't know if I like this. I don't know if I want this. Yeah, but here it is now fleshed out in an individual, in a a single man named Bartimaeus and what this looks like. And so the question then have cake again, or something. Have a have a reception after church. Congratulate yourselves. <laughs> Which <laughs> might in some ways feel perfect leading into the next chapter. Didn't we just celebrate last week? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. And you that, know, Jesus, that, <laughs> Jesus is gonna curse a fig tree too, but you're not gonna have to deal with that one. So, you know, whisper a prayer of thanks to the lectionary committee. <laughs> Uh, we want to connect with Jeremiah. Yeah. Do you mean, do I want to connect Mark 10 with Jeremiah or do I want to personally connect with Jeremiah? The former. Yeah. Oh, there. you want to connect? It? <laughs> yeah. Is there a connection? I was, I was doing the latter. Uh, let's see. Yeah. You, 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 but I think it's, I think the connection is verse eight. Oh, but, really? Yeah. Just saying. If you're looking oh, for the connection, you think that the- I'm not making fun of you. I'm making fun of the lectionary. Yeah, right. I know. Yeah. I know. <laughs> so literal. So literal. I don't know, Caroline. Why would like, you choose that one? Like, hey, it's from a happy part of Jeremiah too. How great is this? Ooh. But it. But I. I know it's an obvious connection. But, uh, but I do like then verse nine in terms of the you know, the promises for Bartimaeus that, mm. that uh, I will let them walk by brooks of water in a straight path where they shall not stumble. And so, mm. you know, that, that gathering up, that gathering up uh, from the farthest parts of the earth, uh, that is, is what God is, you know, doing in Jesus and the you know, promise of Mark. And then it's um, for the sake of a, as I said, with um, with Bartimaeus, a rising up, a resurrection, and so this uh, for me, this gives. I know the obviousness of it, but it does give sort of a picture, right, of what of of what part of the way is going to look like for Bartimaeus. It's going to be a hard way for all disciples, but there's a there's there's those that promise of the brooks of being besides the brooks of water and refreshment, and how that how that is part of the uh, healing and wholeness and salvation that Bartimaeus is experiencing. Totally agree. It gives us nice imagery and language to imagine this. Uh, In in my Presbyterian tradition, I would craft this into a call to worship Mm. from the beginning of the service to put some themes out there on the table. Sure. Uh, Verse nine in particular. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I I do all, I could, I could, I could make something of all these verses. (laughs) I'm writing a call to worship. You could do that. There you go. Three of them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you made mention just a moment ago, Matt, that this is pulled from, you know, the the joyful places of Jeremiah, who for so long uh, is obviously a weeping prophet. And it is noteworthy that uh, these verses are um, gladness words from from Jeremiah. Um, And I just want to put in behind now that I tried to think of how would I make that connection and Caroline, I agree with you. You've done a wonderful job of doing that. Um, It's just the recognition of the difference in this when looking at the rampant social injustice uh, that Jeremiah has been um, uh, lamenting against the people that the promise of the presence of God is indeed this healing, uh, this restoration, this opportunity, which will result in the singing uh, of of gladness. Uh, So I I, I want to, I I don't want to forget what brings Jeremiah to this gladness. Our last lection from Job. There's Job's response. 
Job's response. Yeah. yeah. The humility, the repentance, the ability to be able to, in his own navel gazing, to say, God is good. That's, for me, as I said last week, so important for how we move through this text. And going back, you know, four weeks ago when we started this, when we begin to think of this as how we think justice should be, very clear, black and white, we do this, we get this. God has to follow that plan. But this entire book leaves us with so much ambiguity around that worldview, but it doesn't leave us with any doubt that God is good. I would think about, if not adding verses as well, as we talk about God's goodness, um, Surprise. to note that in verse eight, God commends Job Yes, about speaking truthfully. So that's worth catching. Um, yes that Job is still a reliable witness, even in this court case, and Job's a reliable witness in the way you just described Joy in terms of um, his commitment to God. I want to say something about the epilogue of this ending. Yeah. Because I'm going to uh, say, do you want to go first, Caroline? Or no, you? go ahead. Okay. Uh, a lot, you know, a lot of the scholarship around it is is critical of this ending as being haphazard and, trying to imagine that these quote unquote replacement children can undo all of what comes before. And it's some, it's a lot, it's sometimes trendy to criticize this ending. In fact, I was teaching Job last year in a congregation and everybody was just jumping all over the ending saying this would be such a better story if there wasn't this ending and whatever, whatever, whatever. <laughs> and I finally had to stop and say, um, like, I get that. I get that this is not a, a restart. This is not a making it all up. I get that grief lasts and all of these things, that those losses that Job suffered are permanent. But there's also something really beautiful about this. And to deny the ending of having kind of any virtue, I think, risks imagining that people who have suffered devastation can't find happiness again. Amen. People who have lost spouses or children can't find happiness with new families and things Preach like not. that. So it's it doesn't have to be either or. It doesn't have to be a good ending or a bad ending or a satisfying ending or an unsatisfying ending. It's an ambiguous ending in an unamb- in a very it's, sorry. It's an ambiguous ending morally in a very ambiguous world. Yes, but it does hold out the hope of if not restoration, at least a new beginning and new opportunities and new happiness. Thank you for that. Yeah. I want to say that. Now, if Caroline was going to like just dump all over the ending. (laughs) No, I, uh, no, that was really, uh, I, I thought about uh, that a lot too. I, and, um, and I, I, at the the same time, I I really appreciated the commentary, right. The conclusion without resolution, uh, and and maybe that's what you're getting at too, Matt. It's it, there's not a resolution, but that doesn't that doesn't mean there isn't uh, there isn't a future. And so the and that and and you see kind of um, you see kind of this future here in really concrete ways that I I find quite compelling uh, in that. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before, and they ate bread with him in his house, and they showed him sympathy and comforted him. And it that that little glimpse too, it's not it 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 is it acknowledges that the um, the that that need for sympathy and comfort is still there, uh, and will still go on. But there's also there is a there is a going on. There is something that there is a future here that doesn't discount the past. And so, yeah, I just I was experiencing this ending in that way. Yeah, yeah. I'll just stop there. But that, mm-hmm. yeah. So interesting. <laughs> I, I I really I you know I said preach there because I I really do appreciate that that um, sometimes where we are right now. Um, we 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 had to be reminded 
to lament. You know, in, in some Christian context, we're supposed to ignore adversity. And so we had to be reminded that there are psalms that are just weeping. Uh, that uh, So we have to be reminded of that. But I really appreciate what you said, Matt, because in that reminder, I don't want to be stuck in my identity being that I was a victim, that I was abused, that I was marginalized, that I was silenced. I, I, I want to believe that um, in Christ, I will have the opportunity of being healed, of being restored, of having an abundant life. And so the ambiguity of living in the dangerous um, reality of now with the yet-to-come promises of God almost fits with every text that we've read uh, these last four weeks. As we began uh, four weeks ago, every one of these texts is difficult, and yet every one of these texts is real. I think the psalm, uh, you, there's so many connections here. Uh, when the Lord restored the fortunes um, <laughs> and yes. uh, the Lord has gone, done great things for them. Yes. The Lord has done great things for us. Restore our fortunes, O oh Lord. I mean, you've got a lot of language there that you can use uh, for, you know, for uh, Job and even for Bartimaeus, right? In terms mm-hmm. of restoration for, restoration for him. I, I, so I think you could definitely do that. I, but I also find this Psalm to be one that how can you sing this or how can it be, how can it function? I I say this all the time, but how can, (laughs) you know, function liturgically as a response to some of the, the challenging theological aspects of what we've been talking, talking about homiletically. And so, uh, to just allow for that response as much as there is allow for the response of lament and tears, uh, Mm -hmm. that there's the response of, of joy and praise and worship. And so that's what I would do with the song. Yeah. It's a beautiful song. It is. It's a great song. It is. And it's got this, this ambiguity in the beginning too, right? Where it's, it's often translated as past, but a lot of interpreters think it's also going to be future. Mm-hmm. In terms of how the Hebrew verbs there are, are operating, that um, this could still all be anticipating. This is what God is going to yet do, and when God does this, this is what we're how we're going to respond and um, to play around with that kind of confidence. Yeah, in God's restorative work. Yep. Yeah. And Hebrews. He's still the high priest. He sure is. <laughs> <laughs> is it? A- this is an odd little section of Hebrews uh, in, in many ways. And because you're continuing that imagery, right. That Hebrews is building, but it, uh, but I'm, I, but we're also, you know, we're adding on. And so it, I think it just makes it hard for preaching this to say, okay, what did, what did we say about the high priest before? And now what do we say about the high priest? And, you know, yeah. so that's the, that's the challenge. If you're working through this, you kind of have to go back and say, okay, what, it, what are the distinct, what are these distinctions now that are being made about Jesus as the high priest, high priest and what, what are the, what are the particularities of his priestliness yeah. or whatever that that he that the author of Hebrews is zeroing in on here? So just wanted to name it a little. But it's uh, but you know you you've been talking about this. We've been talking about this the last few weeks. But you joy particularly that this you know this image of Jesus as priest uh, and uh, I mean it could be it could be for um, it could be for people something that resonates, you know, and so not to discount that um, when right. we think about, and I talked about this when we were, when we were beginning with Hebrews in that uh, how, how many Christological portraits are we kind of, uh, we either truncate or we kind of push to the side because we say, oh, people won't really resonate with that. You know, what, what difference does that make? And, and so, but what happens when you, when you, when you really unpack an image like this, could there be something that would 
And I think that's what you do too. I mean, if you really want to go with this image and this understanding of Jesus as priest, what difference does that make? What is there one angle or one aspect of what uh, the author is doing here that uh, of of the priesthood of Jesus that might really connect with someone, connect with people um, in ways that you know just hadn't thought about before. So before you say no, kind of just. You know, anyway. I didn't bring this up as we started, but uh, there's so much uh, unidentified in Hebrews. We don't know exactly who wrote it. We don't know exactly who it's written to. But what we do know is that it is filled with familiar images that those who would know the Hebrew scriptures would get. So, you know, Hebrews, um, uh, the Jew, obviously it's a Jewish community. Uh, one would, one would, 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 would believe because of the references. And so the reference to Moses, so the reference to the priest, so the reference to the incarnate son, so, so the reference to the angels, so the reference to all that they would know in their scriptures. And so, Caroline, as you were speaking, I was noting, if we have the idea that our folks wouldn't get that, it's maybe because no one has been keeping that particular Christology or that particular imagery before them. And so um, uh, it, it's an invitation for us to recover and and can, and keep that alive before we make this transition that is going to happen uh, as we move move along to chapter eight. Yeah, again, it's it's um, so much in here about Christology <laughs> as we're talking about. But the challenge is, how does this play itself out? Like, what does this mean for us? And what is our salvation like or about? Or how do we even talk about it? And if you're tired of the metaphor, I mean, this stuff will keep circling back for another couple of weeks, but with a little bit more intensity each time as part of the structure uh, of the book. But just to notice some of this stuff, this idea of his priesthood continuing forever this is part of what the book means by what's often translated as perfect or, or complete or in all of its fullness. Uh, Chris Holmes in the commentary talks about how for all time there uh, could be translated and said to save completely. So what does that mean to be, to be promised that? The language in verse 26 about holy, blameless, undefiled in this context doesn't necessarily have to mean sinless as much as it can refer to as deathless. In other words, mm. death and Jesus were incompatible, Yes, which is why his death then is so dramatic and unleashes all of these things, which I think is helpful because it pulls people away from imagining sacrifice because a lot of people have been taught sacrifice means a transaction of some sort, right? Like of a God who's like, I would love to be forgiving, but I really like blood. And so therefore I'm going to need to see some blood spill. You know, all the problems that that, of course, I'm exaggerating. I, I'm exaggerating, yeah. But you know, the, but to help people see that it's not so much the cost w- had come due or a, a price had come due, but what does it mean to speak about a God who is incompatible with death um, and who comes among us to share that vulnerability and then to transform that in the process? Could be a really yeah a powerful sermon. Yeah, and I think too that that what we're getting at as well is how people think about why Jesus, what was the role of Jesus, what did Jesus do, what did Jesus accomplish, and and another one of those places is verse twenty five, since he always lives to make intercession for them. I think that's a often a typical Christology as well, right? That Jesus is this intermediary between us and God. And so it, it, I think this book really uh, invites preachers to kind of take on some of the, that, that really pressing question of why Jesus, what did Jesus do? What role does Jesus have in your uh, not, not just for, as you were talking about uh, are, are like a certain guarantee of salvation, but uh, but 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 also how you navigate your relationship with God, uh, and how you think about uh, how you think about how what how Jesus functions in that, um, and imagine that. So another 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 place to think pretty some pretty good 
heavy Christology with people that could open up a lot of doors. Christology. Wow. Sermon Brainwave is a production of Luther Seminary's Working Preacher. Working Preacher has been a trusted source of inspiration, interpretation, and imagination for preachers worldwide since 2007. Find episodes and links at workingpreacher.org slash brainwave. And be sure to rate, subscribe, and comment on YouTube. Thanks for joining us.